So thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm going to share some of the, uh, some of the perspectives from Sweden and the, uh, the current uh, uh, trends in Sweden. Uh, maybe I should also start off saying that I'm now working in a level two context. It's a large level two unit, but from 28 weeks and onwards. So in a way, I have a bit of a distance to the actual peer viability, which in this context, I think is a good uh, thing. First of all, I would just like to remind myself, but also you, that if we try to do something, we may also succeed. And uh, that is also applicable to healthcare. Uh, the guidelines that we have will impact outcomes. That is nicely uh, illustrated uh, in this paper from the United States where they looked at uh, uh, survival of extremely preterm infants and the relation to uh, variations in treatment strategy. Simply put, the higher the rate of active treatment given, the higher the survival. Uh, and uh, now let's see if I... So for 22-week infants, uh, survival was much, much higher if you provided treatment compared as if you did not provide so much treatment. So it's quite obvious, of course. And what was mostly uh, interesting, I think, was that whether clinicians provided treatment and to what extent they provided treatment accounted for the majority of the between hospital variation in survival. That's food for thoughts, I think. So what about Sweden? Well, it's a small country far away for most people. Uh, we have tax-funded health care, so it's equal health care for all citizens. Uh, health care is divided into counties, and they are grouped together in regions. And the level two care is provided in every, in every county, and level three care is centralized to the regional centers. In the past, and in the past is not long ago, it's more like 10 years ago and 20 years ago, there were different ethical traditions having impact on the care provided at the regional centers. So in the northern part of Sweden, they had a more uh, uh, plight or duty uh, perspective, uh, stating that we should always do everything while in the south of Sweden, Stockholm and downwards, uh, uh, we were thinking that uh, we should do everything if the benefits outweighs the risks. That was our perspective. And this led to quite big argumentation between neonatologists in Sweden uh, uh, since uh, 1990s. And it also leaked out, so to say, in the, in the public media. This is just a, a debate article from the main Swedish newspaper in the year 2001. And even a few years ago, it was uh, news on the Swedish radio about that preterm babies did not give, were not given equal care in different cities in Sweden. And actually, similar to the US data, mortality were different, or slightly different at least, between regional centers in Sweden. If we look here between Stockholm and Uppsala, which are neighboring cities only 60 kilometers away from each other, uh, while mortality rates were similar for 25, 26 weekers, it was difference between uh, four infants born 22, 24 weeks. So this led to a more <coughs> uh, constructive discussion after some time, and uh, heads of departments met up and. Uh, and um, uh, put together national guidelines as presented by Ulrika. And uh, I think that uh, this uh, <coughs> survival graph that also Ulrika showed was quite important for this discussion, that uh, survival are seemingly increasing <coughs> over time, uh, and uh, uh, also for the 22-weekers, so we need to sort of come to a conclusion how to provide care. And this is a very similar table to uh, what Ulrika presented, but I think it's a, a very proactive strategy. So at 22 plus zero weeks, 
parents are advised to be or transferred to a regional center. Uh, antenatal steroids are considered and neonatologists should be present at delivery uh, at 22 plus zero and resuscitation could be considered. So what is the problem with the Swedish guidelines? Well, they are, the good side is that they are specific on activity and active care, but they are actually quite unspecific on how to involve parents. Uh, this is a direct translation of what is said, that parents should be given realistic information about survival and long-term outcomes based on the latest statistics. I, I personally don't think this is a good way to sort of write about parental involvement anyway. I think it's almost a bit paternalistic. Uh, the other thing that is sort of missing in the guidelines uh, is the question about comfort care and withdrawal of care, which is a different topic. Um, but it's a good start, I would say. <coughs> so coming back to this, if we try, we may succeed. So only a few weeks ago there was this uh, uh, um, paper on survival of preterm infants published in JAMA and I sort of took out a few of the figures <clears throat> and I think this is probably the most interesting figure. So this slide shows uh, the proportion of live births and stillbirths uh, today and about 10-15 uh, years ago and as you can see it seemed as is as we in the past regarded more infants as stillborns and today we regard them more often as lieborns. I'm not sure if they are truly different today <laughs> compared to 15 years ago but I think it's a different perception nowadays how we see those children. Uh, so the question is of course uh, is this only a way to look at the babies uh, that we do our work so to say or is this is a or is this a result of more active obstetric management, resulting in a true higher rate of live births? I think nobody knows. Secondly, more of the 22-week infants survive nowadays. Uh, if we just look at the figures here, you can see that if we base uh, the percentage on NICU admissions, the rate uh, or the proportion has doubled. If we base the figure on live-born infants, the proportion has tripled. And if we base the figure on all deliveries, the proportion has increased fivefold. So it's um, uh, raising a lot of questions. Uh, first of all, do more infants survive due to improved care? Uh, or is it simply an effect that we regard more infants as lieborn and therefore offer more treatment and therefore they survive. Thirdly, uh, they also conclude in this paper that uh, even if uh, more 22-week infants uh, survive, uh, they are not afflicted by more, a higher percentage of morbidities at least. Uh, so, and depending how you, how you view this, uh, based on NIC admissions, about 20% are uh, free from severe short-term morbidities. But if you base the number of live-born infants, only 5% are uh, free from severe neonatal morbidities. So, how should we then counsel parents expecting delivery at 22 weeks in Sweden? Well, we know that uh, one in three are stillborn, uh, one in three lieborns survive the first year. Most survivors have major morbidities, and we don't know much about the long-term outcomes. So I just want to share with you now uh, a real discussion that we had in our level two hospital. <clears throat> so there were parents, expecting parents coming into the obstetrics, and the water had broke at 21 plus five. And we were called, we are usually not co called in these cases, but they wanted to see an neonatologist. Uh, and we were wondering if they would like to have a lot of healthcare, of course. 
So um, what uh, we said was that we would like to transfer you in two days to Karolinska University Hospital. And to our surprise in a way, the parents asked what are our rights to refuse to do what you suggest? And we answered, well, we don't know exactly <laughs> what your formal rights are. So we phoned the hospital lawyer and she said that she couldn't advise because there were no legal cases of this kind in Sweden. <coughs> so now you open up your Slido apps and <coughs> give me the answer what you think is the right. Uh, what would you do? Would you convince the parents to be transferred to Karolinska Hospital? Or would you let the parents decide themselves uh, and keep them in the level 2 hospital? Or would you challenge the lawyer and ask her to find the right answer to this question from the parents? Of course, there's nothing entirely right or wrong here, but I agree with 74% uh, of the responders. Uh, my, my personal opinion is that we should have parents involved uh, much more than we do uh, today. <coughs> so, what happened? Well, actually, the delivery or the miscarriage started the day after. So. Uh, uh, there was a late miscarriage at 21 plus 6, so in a way, nature solved this problem for us. I would also like to share a little bit about a bubbling discussion, as we call it in Sweden. There are uh, some uh, uh, people who are arguing that uh, gestational age is not an exact figure, and actually it can be erroneous. So, in fact, a 21-week miscarriage could be a 22-week infant. We don't know this. Uh, so, some uh, senior neonatologists, they argue that we should resuscitate regardless of gestational age, if there are any life signs. And uh, I know it happens that also 21-week pregnancies result in a resuscitation. Finally, I would like to recommend a supplement uh, in pediatrics. This was published uh, in September last year. It's uh, about decision making and uh, periviability in Scandinavia. It's a series of papers. Uh, and since you have the link in your handouts, you don't need to write this down also now. But uh, it's interesting to read, I think. Thank you.